Everybody, welcome back to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. We're heading into a new season. It is coming up on autumn. The summer is quickly closing out, and um, you'll you'll get more uh, you'll get more videos and more podcasts from us as we move into this season. Um, summer was turbulent. <laughs> summer was really turbulent. Um, so, and that's a whole story in itself. Some of the things that went on there, but uh, we're kind of back on track producing. Again, um, the website is offplanetradio.com. Go there, find the YouTube channel, our Patreon. Thanks to our Patreon people who make all this possible. And uh, Emily, tell us what we got. All right, good. Nice to see you back again, Randy, our first proper show in, in, in a while. Um, yeah, so I'm glad to be back here. And I also want to thank all the patrons, those who have stuck through us to a turbulent summer. We really appreciate it. And for those who are not patrons yet, patreon.com backslash or forward slash off planet media you'll be back <laughs> all right um so tonight we have returning guest one of our favorite uh, favorite guests and we're going to do something a little different before we have the man with the eyes to see and the, the hands to draw it we have sean gatro with us but instead of talking about the cloak craft that we normally discuss with him we're going to get into uh weather control and some discussion about doppler and next rad and what's really going on with some of these fires and hurricanes and all that jazz, uh, that's going to be the first hour. And then if you choose to stay with us over into the patrons hour, we're going to have some fun and uh, talk about satire and the alternative media. So Sean Gatreau, welcome back to Off Planet Radio. Emily, Randy, thank you so much. Hey, thanks for showing up, man. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Around here sometimes, that is a feat in itself. <laughs> <laughs> Punch the card, man. Hey. All right. All right, Sean. So, you know, everybody really knows you mostly for your work on the cloak craft and your work still stands out there as far and away the most sort of yeah. complete documentation of that. And I still think people who have uh, ignored whether intentionally or just by their own lack of attention to what actually exists and uh, who've ignored your work have done that at their, uh, you know, the cost to their own knowledge of what's really going on and so i still i still hope for you not i know you don't care about recognition but i still think it's important that everybody find their way to your work and you really have i mean it's all there um but today we're going to talk about something else that you spent a lot of time looking at in fact this is sort of how you got your entree into looking at the cloak craft so why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got into paying attention to weather in general and sort of what you know about created weather sure uh yeah that's really where i got my start into all of this uh i wasn't into the whole ufo thing at all you know a little bit here and there but um it started in uh 2011 where uh the rain wasn't normal um usually here in south louisiana we get the afternoon storms that come up from the gulf and uh by about two o'clock there's a big downpour cools us off a little bit but then it's a sauna that's the normal pattern around here and that year that wasn't happening and uh i ended up um starting to look into radar and things like that and, and trying to figure out well why aren't we getting the rain what, what's going on this it, this isn't normal i mean the grass was completely drying out this section of the city was not getting the rain everything was stopping to the south so when i got on a some of the radar sites and started looking at I started noticing a pattern and the uh, storms would form in the Gulf like they do um, in the afternoons and move up this way but there was a line consistently almost daily where those storms stopped and the colors on the radar you know green a little bit of yellow and orange moving up and then they were turning to a dark red and just expel all of their energy along this certain line over and over and over and uh, as I said, I wasn't looking for UFOs or anything. I was just trying to figure out why the rain wasn't getting here. Uh, and, and that was a good start. 
And um, so looking into that, I can see um, from my backyard, I can see, you know, kind of into the Gulf. I'm not that far from the Gulf, but I'm also right next to Lake Pontchartrain, which is a block and a half north. Um, so I bought some cheap cameras and uh, some cheap HD cameras and set them up and just started recording while I was looking at the radar and looking into different things about weather control. You know, was this a real thing? And um, I had heard about the chemtrail thing. Actually, it was right after 9-11. Um, because I started looking into 9-11 things. And uh, the, the chemtrail, contrail uh, topic started coming up. So that was my introduction to it. Um, even back in 2003, I started noticing when I would walk to work in New Jersey, I'd see these things going over. And I said, that's really not normal. Then when I moved back to New Orleans, 2004, I'd walk to work as well. And I started seeing uh, three um, chemtrails, contrails, crossing at the same point above. I'm like, that's not normal either. But uh, anyway, so I blew it off or, or just put it on the back burner. Um, but getting back to uh, 2011, it um, after looking at a lot of the uh, video that I recorded, I could see a pattern in that too. I mean, I could see the storms forming to the south. And then w with under seven minutes, these things were getting ripped apart you know, at the same spot, I could see it visually and I could look on the radar and say, oh, that's on the West Bank. That's about uh, what we call the West Bank. It's actually south of here. It's about 15 miles south. And I've got friends along that line that were just getting pounded every day uh, with lightning, hail, uh, their power was going out constantly. And that was really intense at the time. So that got my attention. I said, there's something here that there's a pattern emerging. This is not normal. And um, that's really where it all started. So do you have any idea why they would want to keep rain from your area of the city while pounding another area of the city? Or, well, or is that just a side effect of something else they're doing? Well, there's, there's a couple of things that I've never mentioned this on a show, and I'm glad you gave me the chance to, to talk about this. Because a lot of others have talked about, uh, you know, weather derivatives and making money off of uh, either flooding out lands or, or, or keeping rain off of crops and starving this guy and, and so on and so forth. And I'm, I'm sure that goes on. Um, at the time, I thought it was pretty devious. Um, however, there could be a good side to this. And let me just say this now. Um, I was mentioned in 2011, I was noticing this stuff. In 2010 was the BP Deep Horizon disaster. Okay, and spewed, I don't know how many barrel, five million barrels of oil into the Gulf. At the same time, and this didn't click till later, I was reading uh, news reports about oil particulates getting sucked up into the, the storms over the Gulf. And then when the storms would come on shore, it was dropping not only the rain, but the oil particulates and things like Corexit and Cynthia, if that was used as well. So I'm not sure, but it could be actually a, a positive way of keeping that contamination off of the heavily populated areas. It really could have been. Um, and I've got plenty of recorded videos that show this kind of thing. Um, so I don't know for sure, but uh, I know what happens around here. It's been happening for a long time. Um, so that's that's my take. So where in all of this, if any at all, does harp come into play? Because the first time I encountered what I will call the weather modification meme on the internet was probably, I'll say 1999, when I started listening to Dr. Nick Begich, who was talking about harp. And in that time, I think a lot of us were just starting to develop a worldview that allowed for the fact that, well, they told us that they could do weather modification. The Air Force literally released statements to that effect and then the fact that you know obviously for 50 years probably more they've been using uh, various iodine silver substrates in the upper atmosphere to create certain types of precipitation but then you got to this this harp this high altitude of rural research project up in alaska and obviously not the only one and all of a sudden the magnitude of power seemed to shift and indicate that they had the ability to 
navigate storms. I mean, I, when Katrina hit, I was at the point of paranoia where I went, I'm picturing a guy with a joystick in a laboratory somewhere just driving this storm right into New Orleans. So in, in, in your research and background, where does HARP fit in? What, what, what are the layers of technology that we're looking at that have evolved since that time? Um, I'm not really too technical when it comes to that stuff, but I picked up a lot from, you know, listening to interviews. Uh, I'm not going to say the old typical, well, from my research, uh, no, I've listened to a lot of other people online talk about it, and I've just kind of picked it up from there. Um, I'll tell you, when I was in, I think, third grade, I remember us talking about weather control, and one of the things we were talking about was that silver, silver iodide in, in yeah. the storms, and, you know, that was what, in the 70s. Uh, they were also talking about the possibility of using uh, atomic weapons to disperse a hurricane. Uh, but that was maybe just a little bit too dangerous. So those are some of the things that stuck up in my mind over the years and are now just making sense with what I'm realizing these, these systems um, or these, these HARP systems can do. HARP in Alaska to me is, uh, is a test. Um, it, it's, it's uh, what do you call it, like a prototype, a small prototype. Um, and I think it's been uh, developed, especially uh, around here, around South Louisiana, but just on a larger scale. There does seem to be a large grid here, kind of like there is in Alaska, but instead of being, you know, 100 yards across, it's, it's more like 100 miles across. And it seems like there's uh, what I call substations, um, smaller areas that can pop off storms and thwart storms and, and things like that as well. But the big boy is the next red, uh, LIX in Slidell, Louisiana, which is about 30 miles uh, to the northeast. And I think that's the big boy that's, that's really controlling a lot of it. So um, tell, us about I, tell us about next red. What exactly is next red? I, 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 I really don't know. <laughs> I just know it's a really powerful, um, radar that seems to be a lot more active than passive mm -hmm. and people have looked into, you know, Randy had mentioned the, the, the amount of power, um, that, that when it's a harp, uh, people are also tracking the amount of power that is being pumped into these next red stations and, and for what. So, um, to me, it's, it's an active system. It's, uh, it's not just scanning the uh, horizon for falling precipitation, but it's actually affecting the storms. So I, I pulled this up from NOAA, National uh, Climate Center. The next, next rad, the next generation radar system currently comprises 160 sites throughout the United States and select overseas locations. The NCEI archive includes the base data called level two and the derived products called level three. Level two data include the original three meteorological base data quantities, reflectivity, mean radial velocity and spectrum width, as well as the dual polarization base data of differential reflectivity correlation coefficient and differential phase. Thank you. That was yeah. really useful. Great <laughs> techno speak. So that, that tells us virtually nothing about how it actually works. So they're saying this is the next generation radar. So, um, so isn't, and again, this could be my poor understanding of things as I am not technologically minded, but isn't radar, aren't radars usually for like recepting information and like reading information as opposed to generating some sort of field? No, radio transmits, or radar transmits and receives. It bounces okay. signals, so okay. it would be theoretically a transponder. So I guess, right, okay, so I'm, thinking, I'm thinking radar detector, but there's the other side right. of it too. No, okay. radar bounces, okay. sends a signal out and bounces it and times the return on the so signal. the next generation radar then is like, it's 5G. Mm. Oh, that's probably true. Okay, so here's the, and this is just, we'll go off on a little tangent that is one of the weird things my brain does. You know, like I've talked about on this show both before and to you personally, Sean, that I think there, I, I've always felt there's like a connection between your photograph of the World Trade Center, the lightning hitting it and 9-11 and your work that you do now and whatever. In previous interview Randy did years and years ago with David Martin, who wrote the book Coup de 12, which was a fictional account of 9-11. Of 
um, you know, uh, fictional, I did it in air quotes if you can't see, Sean. Um, he talks about uh, that the day of 9-11, there was a gaming competition or conference or something going on, I wanna say in Singapore, but I could be wrong about that. I've read the book a long time ago now. And that there was people there who were competing in the competition that of you know the, the video game and the video game included this concept of flying planes into buildings right and lo and behold that's what happened so I, the idea was sort of implicitly implied that that's what was really happening is that these people who thought they were participating these cream of the crop who thought they were participating in a video gaming competition were actually participating in the event so and, this begins to sound a lot like game theory. Right. So, and then, yeah. so yeah. And then we all know that they have hired gaming champions to be the people who are, you know, conducting drone operations. Right. And they just do it like playing a video game, very detached. Do you think it's possible that that's what we're dealing with here? Randy, you said you think of somebody sitting there in a joystick with a joystick, right? Like play, with a joystick doing this. I mean, is that, First of all, I'd be curious if any of the people out there in the audience who are gamers know if there are any games that are about weather modification or weather control or anything like that. But I mean, we've talked about, I don't know if you've caught any of our series that we've done with Sonia Barrett or even some of the series that we've, series we've done with Cliff High, where we're talking about time and we're talking about simulation. And if we are in some kind of simulation, is that, what, is that what's really going on here? And I find it super fascinating that, you know, <laughs> you're a character. I mean, we're all characters and all of this, but you know, I've told you from the very beginning that I thought there was a connection between that photo and lo and behold, years later, you found the triangle in the photo. What about this idea? What, I mean, like, what if quite literally you're like the uh, detective that is figuring out what's going on in the video game? <laughs> oh my God. Well, it's funny you say that. Uh, I, <laughs> when I was living in New Jersey and I took that photograph, I was making video games. I was okay. uh, the art director uh, at, a, at a gaming company out in Fairlawn. Wow. And um, this is something that Damn, people I'm have good. talked about. <laughs> um, do you remember the fact that there was a hurricane heading for Manhattan? Hurricane Aaron, yeah. Dr. Yeah. Judy Wood, who I think has been yeah. wrongfully maligned about a lot of her stuff, but doesn't help her case by being as bombastic as she exactly. is. But I think she's yeah. right about a lot of stuff. And yeah. she's the person who brought that up. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. It was, it was coming. I remember that. And um uh, the morning of 9-11, that Tuesday, it was the first uh, cool day. We had a really hot summer uh, that year. And I stepped out that morning, and we got that breeze from the west. And I was like, oh, thank God. The sky was clear. It was nice. It was, it was starting to cool off. And then uh, all hell broke loose uh, after that. But the hurricane turned. At that point, it just went back out to sea. And I was thinking maybe that was like plan B. If they couldn't get the planes to work and they couldn't get the holograms to work, maybe they're just going to take them out with the, the, the hurricane or blame it on the hurricane or something. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think there's a connection there somewhere. What do you think of, I mean, have you read D Judy Wood's book or watched a lot of her presentations? What do you think about her idea that the hurricane is part of the creation of the energy necessary for the deployment of these directed energy weapons that operate sort of like cold fusion? I wouldn't doubt it. I've heard a lot of her work. Um, a lot of it, again, is too technical for me, but I, mm. I get the gist of it. Um, I, very possible. You know, those buildings did not come down because of the planes or whatever no. it was. There or was the something fire more. or any of that shit. Or the fire. Or, you know, you go to building number seven. Anytime anybody asked me about 9-11, I said, listen, I'm, I'm not going to sit here for hours and explain everything to you. Just go to building number seven, start there, and tell me what you think. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think those things were, were taken down, um, possibly in a variety of methods yep. and it wasn't jet fuel so by any means. I, I realize that we're now off in tangent land very early in the game. We'll get back. <laughs> but, don't worry. But, this but, is what we do. But, this is off planet know, radio. If we connect, if we connect all this, even back to game theory, game theory is widely used, not only in just the military, but a lot of people don't know that it's used in business projection as well. And the more I looked at these storms, and we, the, the big storm that hit Puerto Rico last year did an amazing amount of damage in the midst of everything that happened in Puerto Rico. Something happened that nobody talked about. Puerto Rico was filing, they were, they were bankrupt. Bankrupt. 
Yep. And in the course of this, and also happened, trying to get statehood, and also trying and to get also statehood. Trying, exactly. So, in the midst of all that, comes this storm, flattens Puerto Rico, takes out power. I mean, they're, they've only just gotten power back in some parts of Puerto Rico in the last two months. That's how bad it was. But what really happened in the background was a deal came in that was designed to stave off foreclosure and create a new, literally created new bond instruments where investors came in and vigorously began to invest back into Puerto Rico, meaning that the same business interests that profit off of misfortune, now we're going to go in and develop, which is kind of what happened in New Orleans as well. How many, right. how many thousands of people were displaced and properties that were ultimately let's say genteelized created raising of value and the speculation and bond markets and investment investment instruments that goes into that and when you look at that and tie it to game theory and the technology behind it i always look for the money and i'm telling you that i think some of this at least even in terms of these disastrous storms has something to do in the back end even with um the type of statistical work that's being done through game theory. I'd like to mention, I was watching the storm going over Puerto Rico. And uh, of course, concerned about my friends and family, not only here, but in yeah. Florida. Once that thing went over Puerto Rico, like a, like a lawnmower, it turned north. And you could watch it wiggle, and they expect it to turn it north. It's going to turn north at some point. But if you notice, it went right over the next red station at Key West. Direct hit. Uh -huh. Yeah, huh? And guess what? In Katrina, when that thing came ashore, guess what it hit? Direct hit. LIX next red station in Slidell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go figure. So, um, so if what you, do you think that means, that it's being steered from there, so they send it out and then pull it back? Uh, I, I, I think there is some kind of steering going on with these, these next rads, almost like, um, so, like a magnet uh, yeah. can repel or, or, you know, uh, or draw it in. So, you know, maybe HARP makes a bit more sense when you understand what HARP does on the ionospheric level, maybe setting up a field that enables them to then be able to begin to move other currents again into an electrically generated field. Same thing happened with Sandy when yeah, it went up the coast. Exactly, exactly. It turned right into New Jersey, right over- uh, Made the Sandy Hook. Yeah, yeah. Made the Sandy Hook. <laughs> that was Sandy it's, Hook twice. It was Sandy Hook, New Jersey, and Sandy Hook up in Connecticut. Yeah. yeah. Now that yep, storm yep. hit right here where I lived. We expected to be deluged by that storm. We got- we got some of it, but we got nowhere near what happened when that storm diverted back out onto the coast when it came inland slightly. It's well, only 100 miles inland. And I have more game theory for you here. And I've mentioned this on this show before in a totally different context, but this goes to what we're talking about here. And I'd love to hear what you think about it, Sean. I think it's incredible. I mean, this to me, this is uh, almost proof that we're living in some kind of simulation or computer programmed reality that you have. Uh, within months of each other, a Hurricane Sandy that makes a hook, right, and creates all this brouhaha. Then you have the Sandy Hook massacre, and of course, also mention of Sandy Hook in the Batman movie, right? And then on the map, yep. Yeah, just this past year, within a few weeks of each other, you have Hurricane Harvey. You have the Harvey massacre Weinstein. at the Harvest Festival, followed by Harvey Weinstein, and then yep. all of these fires. Yep. So mm -hmm. there's something being coded with those words. Something is supposed to happen. And it's almost like the uh, players in the game somehow all create some kind of event to snap to that. And there's a variety of them happening with the idea that as long as one of them succeeds, then what, you know, mission accomplished of whatever the program is. I, I see it uh, like an analog game, really. Uh, I've always said it, it seems like we're being controlled by a bunch of kids who grew up playing the board game mm -hmm. Risk and mm -hmm. are still playing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and we're the pawns. So, no, it really does seem um, very unnatural and, and very driven, um, a lot of this stuff. I mean, you've got to think, um, in our collective history here, we span well over 60 years of knowledge. 
I don't remember storms like this as a kid. And I don't remember storms like this to this intensity and degree, although we had obviously horrible hurricanes. I mean, we had two hurricanes within six years that hit right here in Pennsylvania. The first one was Hurricane Agnes, which just hit twice and flooded this entire valley that I live in. We've seen these kind of storms, but we haven't seen them with the intensity and the precision that they seem to be hitting now. And they almost seem like waves. It seems like they just lob waves of storms that, I mean, Florida suffered through it for the previous decade, and then it just died completely. Yeah, we, here we've had to deal with hurricanes, you know, all my life, and we didn't evacuate until Katrina because nothing was that big of a threat until 2005. Um, when I was a kid, I used to go up on the levee for Category 1 and 2 and lean into the wind at a 45-degree angle and just have a lot of fun. It was, you know, people would barbecue, have parties, whatever. But Katrina was the first one and would convince me that morning because I stayed until Sunday. Uh, and it hit Sunday night. The sheriff of Jefferson Parish uh, got on TV and literally said, haul ass. And for him to say that, I'm like, all right, sheriff, you got it. I'm out of here. So we packed up our stuff and left. And um, But th th then there was a big lull after that, um, uh, after the oil spill in, in the Gulf and everything. And it seems like there were no storms really making it to shore. There wasn't much of a threat. And then, like I was telling Emily earlier before we came on, uh, there's been no threat this year at all. Nothing. Yeah. What's so, weird What's weird to me is that most of the country right now is dry. We have had, don't quote me on the numbers, but this is what I remember reading stats. This summer here on the eastern, eastern seaboard, we've had 78 out of a consecutive 90-day period of not just rain, but significant rain, and in some cases, torrential rain. I mean, it's almost a joke around here right now. Oh, it's time for the daily monsoon because... It's felt all winter like we live now in a rainforest here in the East Coast. Meanwhile, the West is tinder dry, burning in some cases, and a lot of the country isn't seeing a whole hell of a lot of rain. But for some reason, they've just, they've just absolutely deluged us all summer here. And I say they because I've never seen weather patterns like this in my life. Yeah, I, I've, I mean... I, I know I, I'm, we're having the opposite here. We haven't had anything. We haven't had any, you know, for a, we were having a cool summer in the beginning and then it got very hot. And now it's kind of more leveled off. It's still pretty hot. I don't see any signs of fall coming yet. I know you're saying that you're feeling autumn coming or whatever, but I remember when we were little, we, it used to rain more often, right? Like it used to rain, you know, frequently. Now it doesn't rain hardly ever at all, but when it does, it's always some, you know, extremely large amount and whatever. And kind of like what you were saying, Sean, like you always had hurricanes when you were a kid, you just batten down the hatches and stayed. And now it's like what you're talking about. There's none for a long time. And when they come, they're huge. Um, it's so, uh, I mean, even just, there's other things about the weather that just feel fake. I mean, obviously we can talk about, you know, the sun, like, are we looking at the same sun we were looking at when we were kids? Same with the moon. The moon is doing some awfully strange stuff lately. Hmm. But even like last year, like a friend and I were constantly talking about how even the rain felt fake. Like it, the rain was falling out of the sky, but it wasn't actually seeping into the ground. It was just like beating on top, right? Like there would be like water, but it, the dirt would be dry. It, and it didn't feel wet outside. Like it used to feel wet when it rained. It was like bizarre. And sometimes like, the nature doesn't look real. It looks almost like a stage set prop. And it's not the same every day. I mean, I exercise outside most days of the week. And I swear to God, sometimes it feels like I'm in a different place than, than other days. Have you noticed any of this? Like, what is, does the, what, aside from the weather being controlled, are you noticing that some of it just feels oddly unnatural in other ways too? Yeah, yeah. And, and I wanted to mention this to y'all and the listeners. Um, we're going to get back to chemtrails briefly because okay. what I've noticed, and I noticed this a week before Katrina in 2005, I lived on the main street in New Orleans here. And when I went outside and it was raining, it looked like, like there was a layer of soap on, on the uh, yes. asphalt. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. yes. And I'm like, it's bubbling up. I'm like, who put soap on the road? 
Yep. But at the time, it didn't I've make sense. I've noticed that before, yeah. In my backyard on the, the downspout from the gutters, when it comes out, it's bubbling. It's bubbling, and if you look at it at an angle, you can see an oily sheen to it. Yep, I've seen so that. So that's my freaking rain. Well, I I'm stay out of the rain. Well, I'm going to speculate what that may be based on the fact that I do have a background in material science. If you take aluminous oxide and dissolve it in water and you look at the effect of what that does, it is a desiccant, but it's also very luminescent, and it does act as a surface stress breaker. So if you were pulling residual aluminous oxide plus some other bonding chemical out of the atmosphere through rain, that is pretty much what you would expect to see. That would be it. Yeah, I've taken plenty of pictures and sent them around, um, and others are picking up on this as well. And they're saying the same kind of thing. So we, you know, back to chemtrails and the chemicals and the, the metals up in the atmosphere, which can bring us back to, again, next red, uh, the microwave pulses. Uh, I, I always talk about what happens when you put a fork in the microwave. It starts heating up and sparking and everything yeah. else. What would happen if you put that fork outside of the microwave and left the door open and was able to turn on the microwave? It would do the same thing. It's still going to spark up. It's going to heat up. That's interesting you brought that up. This next rad isn't, in fact, the same type of radar. It's on an amplitude level of like thousands of times more powerful because it's running at microwave frequencies right okay that's an important distinction okay and then more the metal part Noah, by the way what's that that's more than we got from noah by the way are yeah saying, are, are we saying then that like harp sets up like a boundary point of like an open air microwave right yes. like it creates a frequency field that is like a microwave with the door, but there's no, it's not closed. So then any of the metal particulates that are either in it or outside of it within a reasonable range are going to spark like it would for a microwave. Yes, and heat up. Okay. And if you had a cloud filled with metal particulates that was mm -hmm. pulsed by a Nexrad microwave, what would happen to that cloud? It would heat up. Would it release all of its energy? Uh, would it rise up? What you're doing is you're creating false weather, simply as that. Yeah. That's what it is to me. Wow. What yeah. about, just out of curiosity, and this is like a little bit of an aside, but back like not right away after the Katrina, but like in the years after, right? I remember reading some articles about that the real purpose of Katrina was to drive everybody off of that coast and off of even some of the inland area that, that some of the inlets went to to create algae farms because that was going to be the new kind of power or whatever, right? Do you know anything about that? I know that the oil spill created, the, the year uh, 2010, the oil spill created a lot of different types of algae out in the Gulf and actually that's, photos were right. forbidden. Okay, that, of that's it. right. I meant the oil spill, not the Katrina. I can, I got myself confused. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no. Uh, it, I think it's all tied together because mm -hmm. What happened with Katrina, uh, the insurance rates, the flood insurance rates skyrocketed a lot. People weren't able to afford anything here. Um, and then with the oil spill, what happened there was um, uh, along the coast, uh, the shrimpers couldn't make a living. Right. So they had to get up and leave. They moved out. Who came in and bought their property, I wonder? And I wonder what's under the mm -hmm. ground there. Probably a whole bunch of oil, maybe. Yep. So, yeah, um, a lot of the people have been driven out of South Louisiana for economic reasons, uh, whether it's from, you know, hurricanes, uh, flood insurance, um, home insurance, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. So economically, it's uh, the Louisiana coast has been drained one way or the other. Have you heard of what I'm I, have you heard about what I'm talking about? These algae farms, though? No, not really. Mm -mm. I mean, it was just for a short period of time. There was somebody who had an interesting series of articles about that, that, you know, it was like a long series of articles. I mean, it made sense. It wouldn't actually prevent any of that other stuff you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of things, you know, there are oil companies are looking into doing things with algae farms. So it would be kind of like a multi-purpose use of that space. They can pull the oil out. They can also grow the, the algae on the, the top level. You know what I mean? Um, it would be sort of, I was just curious if you knew anything about that, but. I, I thought about that early because I know there's a, a fuel, I think it's called JP7, 
-hmm. It's a, like a specialty fuel mm -hmm. and it's made from algae. Yeah. So you'd have to grow the algae somewhere, right? Yep. So, and then you're talking about oil companies wanting to invest in the algae. Yeah. So, but yeah, maybe there's something there. And then, you know, so much of the uh, economy and uh, of New Orleans is based on the culture and the tourism. And uh, that is largely based around food and seafood and what is going on with that? I mean, like I went to New Orleans once before any of this stuff happened and did not, did not get to do any of that stuff because I was busy tending to other things I was into at the time. Um, but uh, one of my, you know, one of the things I've always looked forward to doing is going back to New Orleans and getting to just eat and drink and whatever. And ha are people eating seafood down there? What is going on? Less of it. Um, I avoid or try to avoid, if I can, anything out of the Gulf. Uh, because there are really weird things happening to the sea life down there. I mean, not only did it wipe out, what was it like 75% of the dolphins down there, but shrimp without eyes are being mm -hmm. pulled up, uh, lesions all over fish that shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. And um, that is getting into the food system. So I avoid that. I, I'll eat crawfish because they're, they're grown on land. But anything coming out of the Gulf, I, I avoid. No. I mean that, and that's so much of what the cuisine is based on there, though, right? Is fish and shrimp, and and people are just eating it. Uh, yeah, yeah. If they don't know better, I mean, I feel like there's some of the most well-respected chefs and fine dining restaurants and things like that in New Orleans. You know, are they just uh, are, are they just doing it? Are they just like going, oh well, we're just going to eat and enjoy now, and who cares what happens? Or or is there, you know, are people actively bringing in seafood from other places so people can still enjoy the cuisine of New Orleans. Do you have any idea? I know it's a little bit of both and I'll give you a really good story. Yeah, uh, in uh, 2010, I was art director for a project called Dine America. Mm -hmm. And Dine America was started here in New Orleans um, to get people back. No, it was 2011. Sorry. Uh, get getting people to eat seafood. And it was run by a couple of people out of the French Quarter, and they hired me to do all the artwork. And I really didn't know a lot about this kind of stuff at the time. I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. You, you pay me this amount of money, I'll, I'll make your website and whatever. So I went along with it. And um, the whole point was to have on December 1st, 150 restaurants serve Gulf seafood to get people back to eating the stuff. And I didn't look up, you know, any of the lesions or any of this crazy stuff that was going on. I just went along with it. Now I feel kind of bad that I did it now that I know how contaminated the Gulf is. So we uh, broke um, our, our goal of 150 restaurants. We were able to get 300 restaurants around the country for that night to serve Gulf seafood to get people back to eating it. Well, it got the attention of the White House. And we learned the White House was going to participate in Dine America. We're like, great, great, great. Well, you know, what did they order? What did they have that night? We found out that they ordered all their seafood from Georgia at the yep. White House. We're like, oh, really? Why, is there something wrong with the seafood down here, maybe, by chance? So they knew. They knew what to do. Order from yep. Georgia. Don't order from, from down here. Yeah. So, yeah, it's had a, a pretty severe impact. And uh, as I said, I don't. I try to avoid anything from the Gulf. I know a lot of people I know do the same. Uh, but sometimes you just don't know. It's Washington, so D.C. sits less than, less than 40 miles from the Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic seaboard. Why would they order seafood from Georgia? Different seafood. Yeah, the whole thing was to order seafood from down here. Okay. Yeah. And, and, um, so, yeah, there's different kinds of diff – there's a more similar, like, you know, kind of seafood in Georgia <laughs> – New Orleans than there would be in so, in, in Baltimore. Or if I like. can for a minute, I'm going to screen share this because people need to see this in the context of what we're talking about. Um, this is a map. Why is it doing this to me? Okay. This is a map of the next rad installations in the U.S. Can you see that? Yep. And that... Damn. When you look at that, you suddenly Damn. realize that except for a couple of holes here and there. The whole, the whole eastern half of the United States, there's no, spa there's no space at all. Down here, this Damn. is like command and control 
of the entire environment of the contiguous United States right there. That is so dense. I mean, I was stunned when I looked at how densely populated these stations are on the East Coast. Now it gets denser out here in the West, which leads to the question, is that a problem of deflection because of mountains and terrain or what's going on with that? But and for the viewers out there, just file this in the back of your head and understand that this, this is a complete circuit board in which- I would love to see what the interaction of this with the 5G would look like. Yeah. Probably identical. <laughs> but I mean, just in terms of like the way all of those frequencies <coughs> and, and w waves and whatever interact with each other to see if like a flowing interactive map. I mean. Well, the frequency ranges you can begin to build when you have 5G because you're now into gig gigahertz on the ground because the 5G requires transponders and it is not like land uh, mobile communications are currently. They've got to put a shit ton load of transponders out into your neighborhood in order to make 5G viable, which beggars the question, why are they doing this? It doesn't seem cost effective. So I don't know the answer to that, but for the viewers out there, this is what you're dealing with in terms of NexRAD and how densely they're able to populate a field and begin to control whatever it is that's above us in the sky, which seems to be the biggest agenda they've got going. And then I also wonder how this map would line up with a map of underground bases in the United hmm. States. <laughs> like, yeah. That's an interesting question because I'm looking at Pennsylvania and I'm looking at the location of that next rad station sitting right there, number 34, right on the southern western mm -hmm. tip. And if you look over here, that right there is actually and, the Susquehanna River coming down into the Chesapeake Sasquatch. Bay, going right out into the Atlantic. So that's just one situation. And because I'm so familiar with this area right here, I can tell you that's significant. That's not an accident. Let's see what's so, over here on the West Coast. Yep, there's one over there right in Los Angeles. Down in, yeah. Yeah, I just, it would be very interesting to sort of understand the correlation of all of these things. Um, Major you know, overlap on the West Coast here. So look at that, yeah. look at, look at how that dense that is. And then yep. here into the Gulf. And again, you've got a lot of the same thing. Each one of those yellow spheres there represents the range of one installation. And look at this, they've got, Two right there, overlap, 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 except for like part of the panhandle here. They've got the whole, whole golf covered right from through Florida. Very dark. Well, but think about it this way too. Florida is very flat, so there you've got a loop. I, the, the whole thing is a mathematical puzzle to me because I don't know enough about this to extrapolate anything beyond what I'm looking at right now and what my spidey sense tells me. So I want to mention this, and this is something I definitely wanted to mention to you all now that you, you brought this up. Here's a neat little trick. When I started looking at the radar a little bit more deeply, when I realized something was going on, I did look at the next rad things. And if you go to radar.weather.gov, that will give you um, a clickable um, next rad that you can click on. And you can see, you know, in your local area, um, you know, the storms, it's, it's public service. Then you start to figure this out. So what I did was, I was, when I look at those things, see these, what I call blue arcs that kept on popping off from the same spot every day. And they were traceable, you know, on the radar. There it is. And, um, and they were coming from the same spot, especially on the, uh, the southwest corner of the lake. I'm like, there's got to be something there. It's not an X-Red, but it's something else. It's some, something is, is, is splitting the storms when they come in from the west. So I looked on uh, satellite maps, and I really couldn't find anything. I drove out there one day, couldn't really find where I thought it was, came home and started looking again. And then I realized that the radar station in Laplace 
Um, it's actually a way station, sorry, on federal land, of course. It's got a giant tower out there. And it's got a bunch of those white drums, those white Doppler drums mm. up on top. And that was the spot where these blue arcs were coming from, splitting storms. I'm like, well, look at that shit. It's right there. That's It's got to be there. And then I traced another one to I-55 right in the middle, which is uh, northwest of here. And same thing. The, they were popping up from there. I go in on the radar. There are the, those white drums on, on the big towers. The other thing you can do is um, they give you an option on the left side of the page for base relativity and velocity and all these other things. When you click on velocity, you can watch the wind velocity of that radar station. So if it's blowing in from the west to the east, everything to the west of the radar is going to be green incoming, and everything to the right of it is going to be red, like it's heading you know, towards the east. It's, so it's showing the direction of the wind. But what I started noticing is that these red arcs were popping off from the LAX spot. So the wind direction was being caused, it seemed, by the LIX next red. You see what I'm saying? The That's velocity was well. moving out yeah. from that center spot. That's interesting as well to me because one of the observations I made in photographing chemtrails, which I've been doing since 2004, and there was one summer where I traveled extensively and I, I photographed chemtrails in 14 states from Pennsylvania the whole way out to Oregon. And I always notice the where you get the X pattern. If you look at the prevailing winds, you will find that they generally are setting up a convergence point on the chemtrails that goes directly into the prevailing wind, which to me says, okay, they're using that to propel this, the, the aerosol operations, which is how they're able to get it dispersed. In other words, and you would expect them to do that, obviously. So they're using everything that's in the atmosphere, including the wind and theoretically whatever they've set up in the ionosphere via HARP to then create this, this giant um, electrical field that they're conducting these things off of from ground level. It's, it's almost like the, the Doppler radar sites themselves are just propelling points for energy that's then deployed through the upper atmosphere. Yes, I agree. Yep. And I saw that thing a few years ago. I think it hit DC. Do you remember what they called the derecho? Yep. And it was a pulse coming out of like Ohio or something. And mm -hmm. it ran and you could see on the radar, it looked like a pulse coming down, you know, and it's just, oh, really? What's it called? A derecho? Yeah, whatever. Now that really visually seemed pulse to me. So, um, and then, and then finding these red, uh, when you click on the velocity thing, I mean, how else can you explain that? There's been times where storms have come in from the west here. And as I said, I'm right, I'm a block and a half from the lake. And I can see, you know, uh, 270 degrees from the back porch. Mm -hmm. And here, everything is coming in from the west, moving east. And I look at the lake, and everything over the lake is going from east to west in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. I come back in, I pop open the radarweather.gov. I look at the velocity coming out of the LIX radar on slide L, and what is it doing? Pulsing this way, literally pushing the storm backwards. I mean, it's just that obvious. It's easy so, to find. So one, it's being pushed one way and then back that way. Yeah, yeah. And then once you, you, you start forcing the storm back on itself, it's creating uh, more energy. Energy. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. right. Okay, right. so here's my next question. And this goes back to, this ties in Judy Wood's theory, and this ties in the, the, sh the craft. Are these craft being, are they, is the weather feeding their energy? Like we've talked about like what is propelling these craft? Are they, is part of the reason that they're doing it to support the, the craft staying in the air and staying, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I had a conversation earlier today about it. And uh, in a lot of my videos on YouTube, um, my channel is Industrial Surrealism. This series is called What is in Our Skies. I've, I've asked, 
you know, what, what is the chemtrail stuff all about? Is it fuel or is it poison? And it's really both. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last time we talked, I think Randy said, well, is it this, this, and this? And I said, yeah, it's all that and above. There's, mm -hmm. there's a lot yeah. more to it. Yeah. And there's something that we're going to come out with soon once it all, it's all put together. But it's actually another phase, which we didn't even think about, but it's been sitting there the whole time. So I'm not going to say too much about it now. Um, but it's, it's starting to make a lot of sense. Okay. And so, but I just want to be clear that make sure I understand this, this yeah. creation of these the energy, like the, the building of the energy is part of that is part of what is energizing or propelling, or in some cases, so the chemtrail is the food or the poison, but is there also something being created by all of this energy buildup that those craft either rely on or fight against or something like what? I'm not sure. The way I look at it now is like they're, they're kind of salting uh, a snail or mm, gotcha. because uh, the clouds aren't just, you know, random balls of moisture. They're structure inside. Yeah, there exactly. are triangular structures yeah. inside. And it seems like the particulates may stick to these things. Or, or I know they certainly inhale them because I've got video of that. Mm hmm. And I, I know they take the craft and all the particulates. It, they do. It's yeah. the weirdest thing, but that's the way it goes because there's okay. a lot more to the weather than people. Uh, than do people you think understand. there's a biological component to these craft? Yes. I do. do. You think, so you think we're looking at some sort of biological technology? Both. I think we're looking at natural structures that mm -hmm. have been here the whole time. Yep. And I think we're looking at human emulation. Yep. Yeah. And, they figured and out they, how mm -hmm. it works. They didn't and tell so, us. But and some of them, some of them use one thing for food and some use another and they're trying to figure out which does which and who has who and that's what's going on. Yeah. And the whole thing is weather control, and, and, you know, in the end. And then, and then what about the idea of the oceans above or the water in the sky? Are we looking at some sort of <laughs> mechanized uh, ray, <laughs> manta ray, stingray kind yep. of stuff? What are we looking at? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that took a while for me to, to really um, kind of accept. This is because huge. Yeah, because coming from my background, which really wasn't into this stuff, mm -hmm. I initially thought military and only military because I had mm -hmm. studied military stuff. I, I knew, you know, plenty about military weapons and whatnot. And I'm like, oh, this is one of their auroras or something like that. Um, and then remember at the time, it was 2011 going into 2012, there was a lot of talk about alien invasion. And what was it, December 21st, 2012, yeah. and yeah. these aliens are going to come. I'm like, well, really? Well, what's this going on up above? Is what are you talking about? And I really didn't fall into that stuff, but it it, it allowed me to go into the possibility. All right, maybe not military. Maybe it's alien, and then maybe it's natural. And um, as my channel started getting more subscribers, I was getting these comments from people. Sean, look into elementals. Uh, these yeah. are you know uh, living beings and. And at the time, and I didn't say this on the channel, I'm thinking in my head, you know, fuck off, you dirty hippie. But you know what? Maybe the fucking dirty hippie was right in the end. Yep. Because there is some kind of biological, um, uh, uh, theoretical uh, yep. life to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, there know. is life above. I mean, NASA has, has said we've scooped up life on the edge of the atmosphere. Uh, explain uh, money spiders, spider colonies that live in the sky. Real, well, yeah, mm -hmm. that's a real thing. They follow me all the time. So the the the, uh, the water, the moisture above us is alive, and it does seem like an ocean above. Mm. Okay, and it does seem possibly interdimensional, which mm -hmm. at this point makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. The. Uh... Well, also, military only ever copies natural stuff. They want to make a weaponized, mechanized version of something that's existing in nature, hence AI, hence the internet, hence brain mapping program, all that kind of stuff, right? So why wouldn't it be the same for, for things flying around in the sky, right? And then uh, you well, and yeah, I... Yeah, they, they, they do it in the sea with submarines. It's the same thing. Yeah. It's yeah. just yeah. a different density. Yeah. I mean, look at the whales and, and, and the dolphins that are being beached. Look at all these yeah. kill-offs under, under, under the water. I think they're doing the same thing above. Yeah. The last time you and I had a phone conversation, probably before this week, um, the, you and I had a phone conversation, and then that day I went and floated in the float tank for the first time. Uh -huh. I went to one of those float tanks. And it was, I had a very interesting experience. And then when I was at the restaurant at dinner uh, afterwards with my friend Sally, 
a spider fell from the sky right in front of my face and was just <laughs> hanging there. I think I even sent you a text about it, but we're sitting there in like a super fancy steakhouse, right? We're sitting at the bar. We have like our, you know, filet mignon and our lobster mashed potatoes and whatever. And literally this thing just falls down, right? And pops and it's hanging from like the thinnest little bit of web, but it was like a flying spider. And it just like, it was, to me, it was confirmation. Like I, that's, that's how I get confirmation on some of these ideas that we talk about, you know? It was like, yep, the flying spider, like those sky spiders, the flying spiders, they're a real thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So there's well, plenty of life up above that that is still not explained. And yeah. I think I think a lot of this is um, perhaps the formation of the prototypical coming of the archons as well. This is actually where we want to bookmark this for the hour that we're putting out on the on the public side of this, and then. You guys want to miss miss the second half of this conversation? Really? Uh, it's just about to get better, and we'll turn the corner and join our Patreons on the other side. Sean, tell us where they where, tell people where they can find your work Absolutely. and how they can support you. Oh, um, just by watching my videos, really, uh, on YouTube. Uh, Industrial surrealism is the name of the channel. The series is called "What Is in Our Skies." Uh, you can go to one of whatisinourskies dot com which will lead you right back to YouTube. Uh, I think I've also got the oceanabove.com now, which points to the same site. So, um, yeah, there's, there's plenty of avenues to do it. And just go on there and check out um, uh, parts uh, 1 through 19, which is a good start. But I also tell people to go to my most recent work, my most recent uploads, because now I've kind of perfected how to see these things up there. And I show people how to do it. It's real simple. You take a picture, you add uh, auto levels, auto contrast, that kind of thing. And you just flip the colors, invert, and boom, there you go. Yep. So, um, and Sean, where can people watch your artwork? Thing. Artwork, I've got a, um, I haven't updated it since 2015, art504.com, which is the area code down here. 504 art 504.com is uh yeah a lot of my artwork over the years so and you you sometimes post some of your more current works that are for sale on facebook as well right yeah here and there here right. and there yeah all right guys so uh that'll do it for the first hour we'll see you on the other side yeah, the